Let's begin by all joining together and pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, for you are our rock, you are our redeemer. Amen. So you see the series theme, giant words pasted there. This week, three more weeks after this, you're going to hear this again and again and again. Slow down. This uh, theme kind of comes, though, uh, back from where I grew up. It's the city of Milwaukee. So that city is not this massive, huge city, millions of people, but it's also not a small town. So in Milwaukee, there is a decent freeway system that uh, you get used to driving on, that you find the easy ways to get onto the freeway, and you save time by hopping on the freeway, and it's, it's a place that you use kind of a lot of the time. But for as helpful as those roads can be, I got to confess, I've wondered a lot about the people that put the freeway system in Milwaukee together. Honestly, I am not a civil engineer, and I do not want to have to make decisions that affect taxpayers and maybe make taxpayers pay millions of dollars and extend construction season for a really, really long time there. But there are just a few curves in that freeway system that I think we can honestly, objectively say they're bad. So bad that those specific curves in that freeway system have gotten nicknames like the killer curves, where accidents happen to this day, week after week after week. It's crazy. Even though people know it's coming up, people go way too fast. The curve is just too sharp, and every single week, it happens. The semi-truck rolls over and pauses everything else behind it. Inactive and inattentive drivers they miss it, and they smash into the barrier on the left side. Pile-ups of 10, 20, sometimes 30 cars happen on this one curve, and then miles of backups after it. I really want to know who designed those roads, and maybe did they think that cars were not going to get as fast as they could get? Because even today, even as many times as it has happened, people just speed up into danger and they end up crashing again and again and again. I can also say this, though, from the perspective of being one of those drivers who took that curve too fast. I think I was about 20 years old, and I remember it was me and a friend, and we were heading south through the city, and we had to go past the curve. I wasn't watching it as closely as I should have been watching it, I was way too fast, and then that moment where your stomach just drops, I remember turning the wheel and feeling the car just kind of get out of control. I learned that day that God was definitely watching over me and my friend in the car, because as I hit the brakes as absolutely hard as I could, we slowly just skidded across the road and came to stop about five inches from the car in front of us. And as my heart was beating and just blasting out of my chest. That was the day that I learned to appreciate the way that the city engineers, that the city planners, they'd been really trying to fix the curve all along. You see, they know that people are going to speed into this curve. They know the angle of that curve is too sharp and kind of the road is too expensive to fix from that curve. So painted on the ground multiple times, right? You're coming in again and again, at least three times. Big giant words, it's there. Now, if you look up when you're driving, too, big giant signs lit up. They got speedometers so that they can tell how fast you're going. And if you're going too fast, big giant signs up on top, words that blast again and again, words that we're going to hear again and again, slow down slow down, slow down. Every time I've driven back through those same roads and seen those same words, now I hit the brakes and I thank God for warnings about going too fast. 
I really hope that today you're not sitting here or watching online and experiencing what it is like to speed too fast through life. To feel the crash that comes from going too fast, the burnout that comes from pushing your limits beyond what you should be pushing, I really hope that's not you, but I think I know you, and I know me, and I think we know this culture that we live in. I know that some of you have jobs that demand from you more than a person should give. I know you feel like maybe you need to fill up every moment of every day that you've got something going on big in life, otherwise you're going to feel like you're missing out on stuff that other people are getting. I know this culture around you is pushing you to do more, to fill your schedule up with more, to go faster through life. And that's why we're going back to this sermon series into the book of Leviticus. If you're here, you're going to get this warning flashing in front of you for four long weeks. Slow down. Because maybe it is time to take a step back in life and free up a night of your week and stop pushing so hard. Maybe this is going to be God's warning for you spiritually that if things don't change for you, you're going to crash. Good news, though, don't feel like you are alone in this fast pace, this frenetic culture kind of thing. I'm there, too. And it's pretty interesting. So were the people who lived way before there were cars that go 100 and way before cell phones and TV and constant connection through social media. You see, God knows people. And he knows that speeding through life is something that all people are going to struggle with. So today we get to learn how God set up specific special boundaries for his Old Testament people that would just stop them from going too fast. That would help them slow down their lives. And what we're going to take a look and, and pull out from this are principles for slowing down that are going to be really good for us too. Uh, seeing the smiles on your faces before when I asked what book you probably stopped at when you're reading through the Bible and, and seeing that probably some of you have not gotten through the book of Leviticus yet. If you haven't, then you don't really know all the details of Old Testament life. Today we're going to start with kind of, I think, the biggest uh, boundaries and structures for them in their life. The Lord said to Moses, speak to the Israelites and say to them, these things coming up, these are going to be my appointed festivals. The appointed festivals of the Lord, which you are to proclaim as sacred assemblies. Because you see, for God's Old Testament people, he set aside specific times in their lives when they had to stop what they were doing. A seminary professor uh, got asked the question, if someone would follow all of these laws, every single one like God told them to follow, how many days would this add up to in a normal year? How much time would they take only doing that, stopping everything else, and slowing down? Do you know how many it would be? More than 100. More than 100 days of a normal calendar year would be special days, special weeks, special time when people had to stop had to slow down, had to do life a little bit different. I don't know about you, but I have a really hard time imagining my life like that. Even hearing that these people would have 100 plus days of time off and time away, that hurts my American heart. Because you and I are taught we need to work hard and get ahead and put in the extra time if we really want to be great. You and I see the adventures on social media that other families are having on the weekend, and it forces us to plan more adventures for ourselves, driving further than we've been, seeing more, ex experiencing more. I think for probably almost all of us, work now is not something that is a nine to five from Monday to Friday a week. No, now you have to be available every hour, every day, all the time, because 
through the blessing of communication digitally, you can connect from anywhere to get work done. Our American culture takes the hours we have in a day or a week, and it just pushes us to maximize every minute to get as much out of it as we possibly can. We can admit it. We like to live life fast, filling it full of stuff that needs to get done. So what God sets up in Leviticus 23, it is so different. It's really a different way to think about time and how to use time. This today, this is kind of the most frequent slow down sign that, that he set up for them, that he built into their lives. God says there are six days, Old Testament people, when you may work, but the seventh day is a day of rest. Sabbath rest. A day of sacred assembly. Do you know what the word Sabbath means? It's going to kind of sound redundant, but Sabbath literally means rest. So what were they supposed to do on this day? Rest. Zero hours at work on this day. Zero hours pushing themselves to get more done. Zero hours going fast. But a whole day slowing down, living in each moment as its own, and focusing on just a few and important things during that day. Since Jesus came, though, and Jesus did fulfill all the Old Testament regulations and worship laws, you and I do not have to do Sabbath like they did. We don't have to take a day and do nothing and only work a tiny bit, and only do very little things in our lives. No, you and I, because of Jesus, we are free to decide how to live, free to decide how we want to use our time. And I don't even think that our issue as Christians today, I don't think our issue is so much doing too much, having schedules that are too full. I think the problem that we have is deeper down behind that busyness. I think the problem that we have is this idea that we have in our hearts and in our heads that the more we do, the more we can provide for ourselves. The better we can be as people, the more we can learn in school and master and advance further in life. I think the problem is inside of our hearts. The more we want to do, the more we can do, the better we can be. I think our busy culture is just the outward symptom of a heart problem that you and I truly believe that if we push more, if we do more and we do better, we can get somewhere good on our own. I think the irony of uh, the Sabbath day and God setting this up for his Old Testament people is that the Sabbath rest, it still was all about people and them, and helping them. It was really a day that was about what you did, how you were going to change up your schedule, how you needed to slow down in life. But the big change was instead of working for it, instead of doing more on your own, instead of having it be about you, the Sabbath rest was supposed to be about God's gift for you. It was supposed to be a day where God would change and would shape your heart and make it better. It was a day where God was trying to give you real rest, a picture of the rest that was coming in the Savior that we know as Jesus. That's what you heard about as we read through the gospel a couple verses today when people questioned Jesus and his disciples. Do you know, as they're going and they're picking the grains and they're rubbing it and they're eating it in their hands, that they weren't really breaking God's Old Testament laws for Sabbath time? But to the other people around them, the people that were all about what you did and pushing yourself and doing more, to people out there, it, it didn't look good. You remember how the Pharisees are people that just love outward action. They love filling up life and moving life quickly and doing what you can as much as you can. So Jesus takes this opportunity and he walks next to his disciples and he makes sure 
the Pharisees can see them doing this. And wanting someone to judge Jesus' disciples, wanting that interaction to happen, Jesus let it happen. And you heard how he responded to it, right? As the Pharisees did judge, as they tried to expose Jesus for allowing his disciples to mess with the Sabbath day and and break the rules, Jesus revealed that Sabbath rest, that special picture that God gives, that wasn't about them and what they did. That was about him. That was about what he had come into this world to do. That was about what rest he would give to give them. It was a very clear physical showing that when people are with Jesus, that when Jesus is around his good news, the traditions, the special ceremonies, the special holidays, those things don't matter as much. If Jesus is with you and around in you, that's where you're going to get real rest all the time. This is the way that God sets up his Old Testament rest too. You heard it at the very end. You're not to do any work wherever you live. This special day, this is the Sabbath day, not to you, not to advancing yourself, not to making yourself better. This is a Sabbath day to the Lord. In three words, even for God's Old Testament people, he is trying to point people to the truth that the Sabbath rest is not the thing, but it's pointing people forward to the thing, to the Lord who loved them unconditionally. Not to their own works, not to them doing more, but to slowing down and knowing what God would do for them in the promised Savior who was going to come. And what's really cool is this principle was not just for Old Testament believers and them at that time, but this truth is for all people connected to God all the time. Real rest doesn't come from outward things. Real rest only comes from him. Do you appreciate how close we are to some of the best beaches in the world as we live around here? They really are, like, the best. I mean, miles, miles of just awesome and beautiful coast. We've got warm sunlight that lasts for months that we can be out there and not have to wear jackets and be freezing. We've got warm water that doesn't shock your body as you jump in and dive in. We've got clear sand for walking and sitting on. We've got the best shark tooth hunting in the world. Our beaches here, they are just the best. And I'm sure right now, if you've been there and you have it in your heads, you can picture this place of the beach as just a place of rest and peace. And it's something you get to experience just a few miles away. But I think there's a little star and a little caveat that comes with the beaches that are really close by. And the rest that you should be getting at those beaches, it's awesome until you try to go to the beach with a bunch of little kids. That changes what rest time looks like there. You're not sitting back under the shade and reading books. You're running after these little kids into the waves and jumping with them and holding them and splashing with them. You're trying, but you're failing when your little one reaches down and gets a handful full of sand and puts it in her mouth and starts chomping onto it. You're watching these little kids like a hawk because you know these rip currents, these things that people can't see with their eyes. You watch literally as your daughter gets pulled a little bit further out and a little bit further out and a little bit further out and you call her consistently, come back, come back, come back. Beach time with your little kids, even these awesome beaches around here, on the outside, it does not look like the most restful day that you can have. But it was kind of interesting. I think it was the second last time that we went to the beach as a family. It was a day of running and chasing and trying to corral kids back in. It was constant movement for all the hours that were there, physically just going and going and going. But something really weird happened the next day. It was a Monday that next day, and I came into work. It was like 8.30 in the morning, and I didn't feel tired. 
or exhausted or burned out from that day before on the beach. When I came into work that Monday morning, I felt refreshed and recharged and ready to go. So what happened? We had spent that day before on the beach working and playing and running, but we spent that day laughing and playing together and making memories, and I'm going to remember that day so far as the best beach day that we had as a family, making that awesome memory there. You see, what happened on that day is my heart got filled up so full of all the blessings of that day and those hours that no matter what was happening physically, that was a day of rest, a time that recharged me probably more than anything else I can remember in the last few weeks. You see, real rest doesn't have to be from taking time to do nothing. Real rest comes from knowing who has your heart, from what he fills your heart full of, from how long you can meditate on those things that are there. Truths like knowing you have a God who has done all of it for you already. No more struggling, no more climbing the ladder, no more trying to push yourself, no more judging yourself and wondering if you're good enough because of mistakes and failures, no more trying harder, just forgiveness in Jesus, just peace in what he has done for you, just a heart that feels at rest because God does it all for you or rest that you find every single time when we begin our worship and you think about your baptism, when you go through your week and you hear water and it takes you back to baptism, which did happen for you. And God promises you're his child. And God says you are part of his family. And God says this is a relationship thing that does not change from struggles day to day or moment to moment. But real rest that happens because in this, God connects you to Jesus. Or rest that you're going to get to experience in a couple minutes that look just plain and simple in bread and in wine, but rest that comes to you because in it and under it are Jesus' body and blood that Jesus promises is for you, for forgiveness for you. You walk back to your seat with a smile on your face because you're forgiven, your heart has been filled up again. In this, you know that God loves you and you get to taste and to drink and it gives you rest. So whatever way you do it, for these next four weeks, let these be times where God is trying to warn you, slow down, slow down, slow down, and spiritually, Find rest in Jesus that you're not going to find anywhere else. Let these be weeks where you kind of change your mindset and our culture, where we stop glorifying busyness and a busy life and being so full and simply go back to thinking through what a heart at rest, what a Sabbath day was meant to give you, peace in your Savior. Amen.